Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special edition of Channel 781 News Debrief. Uh, we are here in the flesh for our City Council wrap-up session. First, I wanted to uh, start off this debrief by giving credit where credit is due, and that's to us, uh, Channel 71 News. Um, our year anniversary of the first show uh, we ever did uh, is in five days, um, depending on uh, when we release this. Um, and our last episode, our last debrief I've showed, uh, closing out the city council session, makes two full sessions, um, half of every city councilor's terms, um, where we watched and reported on every single city council meeting. Um, I was inspired uh, to do this project um, when our print newspaper went under, our only print newspaper. And the fact that I had watched every single city council meeting for three years uh, up until that point, um, and I had no real outlet for my opinions other than arguing with people on uh, Facebook. Um, in the first episode of the city council debrief, I said I wanted to start it because there's so little independent media in Waltham and, and so little municipal information. And as I knocked on doors uh, for candidates for office, as I you know, went to different meetings and I volunteered at different places. Uh, there was a recurring theme of, of people wanting to know more about what's going on in city government. And then also just Waltham as a whole, there's very, very few places to go to learn more. Um, and so uh, that inspired this to come into existence. And, and I was right in thinking that people wanted that because this has grown into something that, uh, uh, that has, gotten new folks engaged that has gotten folks that already pay attention into a deeper analysis and folks that have been around for a while uh just getting more organized uh and um so i'm very proud of this work by the numbers uh we released in the past six months over 18 hours of analysis uh including interviews um which included uh, sitting city councilors in Waltham, candidates for state office, union leaders in education and labor, community leaders and advocates, uh, and several local artists. Um, not to mention our unique coverage of the Master Plan Board Committee meetings, where we, mostly James, um, recorded every single one, which is over 18 hours of uh, content and, uh, and input uh, by itself. Um, and we were, we were able to debrief on all of those as well. So we have been busy, but uh, next year is also our municipal election in Waltham. And so I'm hoping uh, to stay busy. And I hope that people turn to this channel uh, for information on making an informed vote. Um, I hope they do because we are literally the only people doing this kind of stuff. And so a lot of that information uh, might not be found anywhere else. But we're here today to, uh, to, in the flesh to go over the last uh, five or six months of city council. Um, and if there's no other words that anyone wants to share about 71, we're going to do a little bit of um, we're going to popcorn around highs and lows from the session. Uh, and then we'll do a little bit of uh, predictions on what we think was going to happen at the next city council uh, session or walk in as a whole to the next city council session. And then we'll sprinkle in some random anecdotes. Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about transparency issues and access issues and try to sum up where we are on those. I started thinking about that stuff back in 20. 21 because they I had been following the city council on line and they stopped uh, recording a lot of the meetings. Um, I was one of several people who wrote into the city council in the fall of 2021 saying they should record all the meetings and caption them. Um, Councillor LaCava kind of picked that up as an issue with help from uh, Councillor Paz and Councillor Darcy. Um, but it didn't get resolved in that session. It carried over into the spring of this year. And there were a number of meetings with WCAC kind of negotiating what they could do. It seemed at first like the council had maybe would go with a different vendor. And it somehow behind the scenes, they were apparently told they couldn't do that maybe because they ended up negotiating with WCAC. And the result was that WCAC now records more of the meetings. Um, there are a lot more committee meetings online, but they don't record all of them and they're still not captured. And there's never been a reason given for why they're not captioned. WCAC basically refuses to caption. And I say refuses because people have written to them to ask them to do it and not get a response. And the council asked um, the executive director about it in a meeting and she just seemed very unwilling to do it. 
So I'm not sure what there is to be done. They definitely have money to do it because there is a new committee um, that was set up to spend the money that the mayor allocated um, to improving public access to meetings. Um, so if it costs money to do it, there's money there. And so there's no good reason they're not doing it, except they have an attitude that it's not important when in fact it's required by law. So if anyone still wants to follow up on this, feel free to write to Justin Barrett. He's the chair of the board of WCAC. And if you go on their website, you'll see if you want to write to the board, you have to write to him. And then I guess he's supposed to distribute it to the board. Um, so feel free to write to him. He's somebody who's very influential in town and it's kind of disappointing that he just got an award this year, as you remember the Kevin Ritzy Award, and it's kind of disappointing that he's basically refusing to address this. Also, related to the captions, I, I, when this was being discussed, I remember one of the excuses given was that uh, because it's done through cable, like a lot of people, or like people would have uh, local devices to do the captioning on their on their like cable access. So they may be within the letter of the law by what they're delivering on cable, but then like they don't have, they, they feel they don't have that same requirement to be online postings. Yeah, and my understanding is under the ADA, yes, they do. You have, they're required to caption their online content. And I guess the way they think of it is it's only their job to provide broadcast. Um, so everything they put online is like extra. And it's like, okay, that's fine from their point of view, but that's not fine from the point of view of the city providing what needs to be provided. So I hope there will continue to be progress on that. In terms of talking about access for people with disabilities, there was very little, there really weren't any wins in the council this year. There was a sidewalk safety resolution that Councillor Harris brought in. Um, and that's something that's very important to people with physical disabilities, as well as people in general who have to walk around. And what ended up happening is they passed an ordinance that has an exemption for uh, single family and um, two family homes that all landlords need to make sure the sidewalk in front of their building is uh, shoveled, except for those buildings which make up about half the city. And the way Councilor Harris explained this was that they had gone, the committee had gone to um, public works and public, which currently public works does um, plow a lot of the sidewalks, they just can't do them all. So it's kind of up to them what to prioritize. And they said what would help them out is if some of the big businesses and apartment buildings were done by the residents. So that's what ended up in the ordinance, but it wasn't supposed to be a help DPW ordinance, it was supposed to be a safety ordinance. And if it's a safety ordinance, it should do what needs to be done to be safe. And people don't get to choose if they have to get somewhere, they don't get to choose whether the street they have to walk down is residential or commercial. If it doesn't have sidewalks shoveled, then they can't get down it. And it's un they're gonna be in an unsafe situation. So I didn't consider that a win. Um, the only thing that could be was a win this year um, for the community of disabled people would be um, Councillor Durkee put in a resolution to change the city ordinances to remove an outdated word for people with intellectual disabilities. And uh, I, that was coming to mind just now, and I couldn't remember if it was this session or the previous one. And yeah, I'm pretty sure that was this session. And yeah, it's frustrating to think that that was one of the biggest pieces right. of movement on the disabilities front. So it's not that it's not a lot of progress. Right. It's a it's a symbolic gesture. It doesn't directly affect anyone's life. It's a very important symbolic gesture because nobody should have to go look up an ordinance and see a word that is offensive to someone in their family or themselves. Um, so I, I think Councillor Durkee deserves credit for putting that in because it's the only thing that happened this year that seemed to have the disability community in mind. I th and I think the difference between the two uh, shows that uh, decision-making processes when making resolutions and orders because it, it, was in, it was more of a slam dunk for Sean Durkee because he worked with Opportunities for Inclusion the whole time, uh, which is a great uh, organization within uh, Waltham that also does disability advocacy, and uh, the sidewalk resolution was mostly just Kathy Ann Harris and the DPW talking. If they had really brought in uh, the community of folks uh, that revolve around disability rights, I think it would have went a, a different way, uh, the end result. Yeah, and that should be the model, the fact that he was able to work with them. It, it almost seems like there's a rule against working with third party nonprofits and, and, and Waltham City Council, they often get seen as the enemy. 
but he worked with them and that worked out and that should be the model for making decisions about the fernal. Um, it's another thing that's symbolic, but but really important symbolic is the way the fernal is memorialized says a lot about the way the community sees disabled people. And there was really no one in the council this year who really stood up for that. There was a discussion about the Fernald and Councillor Darcy stood up for protecting um, some historical buildings, but he didn't really mention the fact that, that people live there. And there was one person on the historical commission who mentioned it in that meeting. She was the only one who brought up the fact that there were people who lived there and we should think about them and how we memorialize it. So I wish that whoever now is working on the Fernald, we don't really know who it is, um, would please work with opportunities for inclusion or mass art or both um, and take uh, Councillor Durkee's example to come up with something that's acceptable to that community to begin with instead of trying to sneak something by and then having the community come protest it later on. Yeah, one of the lows uh, this uh, city council session was definitely the uh, Fernald Reuse Committee not being a thing at all. Um, in, in the past, uh, the city council would meet as the Fernald Reuse Committee, which is an ad hoc meeting, and they would discuss uh, the plans for the Fernald. Um, and this session, there was none of that. It wasn't there wasn't even uh, many members assigned to it, and. And what happened with the Fernal, the entire plan was uh, brought out uh, from the mayor uh, that took everyone by surprise. And it's because it wasn't talked about in an open public before. And so it's, uh, it was a disappointing uh, end for the Fernal for me. And that should have uh, concerning, I guess, like foreshadowing for like what could happen to the farm, given like potential lack of oversight and like public accountability. One of the... Uh... Eyes, uh, speaking of disability earth, we actually forgot there was one thing. Uh, uh Paul Cates's uh, mailbox resolution. If you're oh, I forgot about yeah, that. I'm glad you said that. Yeah, definitely, definitely a win. Um, and a good example of a resolution working out. Uh, in the Waltham Post Office, there is a uh, drop box mail where you can access it without leaving the vehicle. Um, and for a lot of older folks, say, look, it was a, it is a very good uh, thing in our city. Um, and in one day, uh, the past couple months, uh, a few months ago, it just like disappeared. Uh, the post office just took it away. Um, and one citizen, I forget her name, uh, reached out to the city as well as her board counselor, uh, Paul Gates. Um, and the post office got back and said, Basically, they had no reason why they took it out and said that they have no plans on putting it back in or putting a new one in. And so Paul Cates puts in a resolution uh, to pressure the post office to reconsider and also to invite the postmaster general and to explain the situation and why that happened. Um, but it didn't need to get that way because a few weeks later they filed the resolution because the post office just like overnight just put it in. Um, and so I think that's a good example of a resolution going the way that a council wants. Um, I actually criticized it on the show when it first came out because I wasn't sure if it was going to do much because it's kind of toothless. Um, but I mean, it, it provided the pressure. Uh, we, we should also mention that CBS Boston did run a couple of stories on it as well. Um, so it wasn't all Paul Gates and that was But I mean, it was just public pressure and uh, it worked out for Paul. Um, he could have not done it um, when he decided to. So it was good. Um, I'm glad you remembered that. That's yeah. a good example. Yeah. I thought an overall low was just the general stonewalling of working towards any amount of progress. I just felt like um, anytime there was a push for um, transparency, for example, getting more information about these master input meetings, um, we were just met with silence or confusing information, same thing with um, 240 Beaver Street information. Y you either get no information or you get uh, hundreds and thousands of documents. Um, and so that's a, that was just an ongoing low in my in my opinion. A lot of the way that this tends to operate, I've observed, is that you'll have exactly that, where it, it, it's like 
ob obfuscating things by making it either very boring or very difficult to engage with or the information difficult to find. Honestly, I would have put the fact that documents are uploaded to the websites without having them like such that you can search through the PDFs. The fact that they are uploading scanned pictures essentially makes it so much harder to deal with any of this documentation and it's unnecessary. It's not like they don't have the raw documents that they could upload. Yeah, there definitely was some improvement this year in terms of the amount of information the city shares on social media. There's a social media coordinator who seems to be doing a good job, but is also seems to be very limited in that somebody has to tell her what's happening and whether it's okay to talk about it. And it seems like also the city clerk's office, they seem like they work really hard to try to make things organized and accessible online, but they're limited by what they're being given and when they're being given to them. So there are some aspects of the city website that are really nicely set up. And then there are some that almost like are deliberately a mess like that um, Google Drive that had all the information, supposedly the background information about the firm. And it was 3,700 pages in PDFs that had no names. None of it was searchable because it wasn't scanned in a, in a OCR way, even though obviously the, the original documents exist somewhere. So it's like, it seems like the staff at City Hall has made efforts to help with this, but there's still maybe people above them who have certain attitudes. And we did see a pattern like the, the essentially the problem with the Fernal one that came up with this year was the mayor came in and asked for permission to knock down some buildings with no context on the overall plan. Just like she came in for permission to close entrances to the farm with no context on the overall plan. And so that seems to be the pattern is that, um, she keeps asking city council to make a very isolated decision and the public never knows what the long-term plan is. And then if people assume that it's something nefarious, then the councilors get offended, but they don't totally correct the record really. So it seems to be that the a lot of the lack of transparency in Waltham comes from the fact that that is the mayor's way of dealing with potentially controversial um, decisions is to put as little information out to the public as possible and hope that we just won't notice. And then when we notice, try to do some kind of damage control that avoids saying you were misinformed, you were manipulated, whatever. And it's like, well, why didn't you just um, uh, inform us properly in the first place? And then we wouldn't have been misinformed. It, it is really funny in, in the context of like the 240 Beaver Street thing that they're acting like there's some sort of like conspiracy from like the nonprofit when it's just like they want to continue operating and they want to continue doing yeah. CSAs, they want to continue farming. It's not like there's anything like there's there's like I, I as soon as I can tell, there's no potential ulterior motive for them wanting to continue operating on the property of beyond wanting to continue operating. Yeah, that's the way I see it too. Is I don't know the people who work for the farm. I don't know all the behind the scenes that's been going on for years here, but if if the farm is, has any kind of leverage, they're going to use it to survive, and that's a good thing. It's hard to see if the if the farm is trying to manipulate things in an unfair way. It's hard to see what their goal would be because what they want to do is do a farm, and that's what we want. Um, and, and like the, it would be easier, I think, to have like trust in the mayor and trust in like what they're the the city using this land. Like, I, because like I'm, I'm not particularly wedded to like having it be used by nonprofit versus by the city to just do things directly. But like seeing how they behave around things like the fernal property doesn't give you the confidence for that, I think. And that's what's funny because you see the council saying you have to trust us. Yeah. You have to earn trust. <laughs> It's yeah, expected. and meanwhile, there there's no trust going the other way because they wanted the farm to do this very complex RFP process that would require a lot of work and money on their part to make everything official. And I think the mayor believes that's necessary, be, that's legally necessary to do it that way. I don't know if she's correct or not, but it's worth pointing out the light show at the Fernal, which isn't ha didn't happen this past year. I don't know why. I don't think it was because of the protest. I think it, maybe they just weren't making money. Um, but it was protested for two years and nobody knows how they got permission to do that. Because there was no public process where the Lions Club applied for permission to use the Fernal because you can't. If you ask, if you make a proposal to do something at the Fernal, it would go to the Fernal Reuse Committee that doesn't, hasn't met in months or, and so every time we're being told like with the farm like we have to go through this complex process to make a decision for the sense of fairness and propriety and legality 
it's worth questioning, is that a more other interpretation or is that really true? Because it seems like there are some times where you somehow, some organizations are able to do things with no process at all. And the light shows an example of that. Very interesting. <laughs> you were talking a little bit about um, gains in transparency and there definitely were, uh, we shouldn't take that away. Uh, during the session, John McLaughlin, I wish I could remember the context, but John McLaughlin was like, you know, people keep bashing us for being untransparent, but this is the most transparent city council that has ever existed in Waltham. And that's actually true. And, but it is because of uh, things like Channel 71 News and pe just people paying very close attention and demanding better transparency. And so uh, it is true that this is probably the most transparent the Waltham has ever been. It's also true that it is not anywhere near as transparent as they could be, as other cities are, and as, you know, Waltham residents deserve uh, from their city government and definitely not enough to make us stop uh, badgering on that. One more thing. So here's a tough question about transparency, right? So we talk about transparency as something you should do because it's the right thing to do. But most politicians want to share information with the public because they want the public to know what they're doing and they want to have some control over that narrative of what the public thinks they're doing and be proactive, not just wait till someone criticizes them and be on the defensive. Our mayor doesn't do that. She doesn't see a lot of value in telling the public what she's doing. And unlike most politicians, she doesn't call back reporters when there's a uh, Boston Globe article, which there was, or another um, professional news article about the Waltham, it usually doesn't quote her. And that means it's mostly told from the other side, the other point of view, like the WBZ um, story about the farm was very much from the farm's point of view. And so was ours, because the farm gave a tour where we could go out there and get all the info we needed to do a story. There was no way to get info from the city to tell their side of the story. So it appeared that that backfired really bad for her twice. One with the farm, because there was like, what, 100 people who showed up at the... That was a huge amount of people who got. I've never seen it that full. And uh, the other one is the the Boston Globe article saying that the housing authority is going to lose about um, was three hundred thousand dollars. And a lot of people read that because it, it had no, the, it had didn't have the mayor's point of view in it, presumably because she didn't call the Globe reporter back. And a lot of people assumed it was incompetence. A lot of people thought it was a bureaucratic error. And the comment she later made at city council seemed to imply that it was on purpose because she thinks it's a bad law and she thinks she's doing the right thing by ignoring it. So if you're standing up for what you believe in, why would you want people to allow people to assume you're incompetent? That's what I don't get. But the other side of this is she's been reelected many, many times. And so the big question is, it looks like things are really bad for the mayor right now. She's had two big, real big embarrassing blow ups right before, right around Christmas of stories blow up. But is it, or is there a silent majority in Waltham that's still gonna reelect her this year, just like they always have, because all of the people at city council, all who watch our show really, apparently there are other people out there with opposite views who we don't hear from very often, but apparently they control elections. I mean, um, the other thing to think about with the election is it was a huge deal last time that Colleen won and she beat out Paul Brasco by 18 votes. And that's amazing that she did that, but she was the sixth of seven candidates for at large. And the five people ahead of her did much, much, much less campaigning than she did. Some of mm -hmm. them didn't. Uh, McMenamin showed up to one of three campaign events, I think. And so is there this powerful, silent majority in Waltham that's going to keep, keep re-electing these people, even when it looks to us like they're doing a really bad job with the public? What I would put out is that these things are related, right? Because you've got the fact that they haven't built like, any more new housing like density wise, which means that disproportionately we have a lot of single family zoned housing is the only like place that people can live. And uh, th that then means that you've got a lot more people that are gonna have different politics as a result of that because of like what their economic situation is. And a lot more of the people that are gonna be living in a situation where they got a bunch of roommates in like some of the, like the living situations that are in Waltham for people who don't have a ton of money, you're not necessarily going to be updating your voter registration every time you have to change places that you're living. You're not necessarily going to be paying attention to what's going on when you move into a new area. And that's 
like played out over the course of like you know lots of like, tens of thousands of people that have lived in the city over the course of decades and it just works out that there is better representation if you're living in a single family zoned area than if you're not uh i had on my lows uh something you just said uh hashing out on that a little bit more about the seemingly inevitability that the mayor gets reelected uh and yeah you've got it's just it's just weird optics for me and you you just spoken on it but uh i would also mention healthy wall fame as well uh yeah. so just right on the cusp of an election year the mayor who has seen all of these things play out in her head probably exactly as they're playing out saw no concern with with restricting access to the farm without ever really explaining why the urgency and and just huge 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 public backlash and no public comments at all from her uh despite the backlash you've got the city on the cover of the boston globe uh losing three hundred thousand dollars and not allowing more dense housing near public transportation no comments at all from her and then you've also got healthy Waltham, which is one of the most popular nonprofits in the city she essentially cut off the knees of that nonprofit almost a year ago and now it just allowed it to go public that they're taking away that nonprofit's ability to use municipal space on march 31st and so it's just it's just strange. It's feel arbitrary. Like so many of these decisions just feel arbitrary. And it's like, just, yeah, it's just strange to me that like she saw, she knew all of these things were going to play out. And you knew that all these things were going to go public, and right on the cusp of her election season, saw no no issue with it. And the, the problem is that I might agree with it. You know, it's just like what what is it going to take to replace the mayor? And I think a large part of it is the fact that a lot of people. Uh, that would vote for her don't know all of these things we just talked about. They see the mayor come to their bar mitzvah. They see the mayor come to their recital, came, come to their uh, cheerleading games. It's like that is the memory of the mayor that they can take to the voting booth. They don't watch our show. They don't They don't go to the city council meetings. They don't hear uh, the weird decision-making processes of the mayor. And so unless, you know, some things radically change. Like, and, I, and some of my friends... Uh, definitely disagree with me that uh, think the mayor is beatable. I just don't see it. I don't know. I'm going to spend my time uh, working on city council races that I think are beatable. But even though I really disagree with the mayor, I don't. I don't know. Unless there's some candidate that I really like, I really don't see myself getting involved in that race at all. And I was thinking. I mean, we don't talk much about national politics here, but I was just just watching what's going on in the house, watching the Republicans. It just is a reminder that there's an old guard in many places, uh, and certainly in Waltham, and people will defend, people will go to really great lengths to defend that old guard. Um, and we see that in Waltham, and um, we've seen how that's played out in prior races. The last mayoral election was um, interesting because it was sort of uh, two old guard candidates, but um, I think to me for the mayoral race, the biggest question will be, will there be any other mayoral candidate? The problem is that at the end of the day, like the, so much of this is tied back to the real estate industry and yes. you're disproportionately going to get, like, if you're going to have people that are going to be able to self-fund their own candidacy, it's disproportionately because they're coming from the real estate industry, which is like what I believe was what Diane LaFlanning ran last time was. And it's yeah, it, this was that was something actually uh, Christine Mackin brought up when I interviewed her way back at the beginning of last year uh, is that the city council is paid as a part time job. So basically, you either have to have a full time job with extremely flexible schedule or you have to be independently wealthier or have a retirement or whatever. So you don't have to work. And that really limits who can serve. And I've been thinking about it because now's the time of year where we want to encourage new people to think about running for office. And you want to, and I'd love to encourage, well, we don't have much ethnic diversity. We have a uh, very bad representation of certain groups in our government. And it would like, it would be great to see um, people from those groups run. It would be great to see younger people run. But when you want to try to encourage people, for a lot of people, it's just not realistic. Like you can't, 
you can't do a job. It basically pays like a 20 hour a week job, but it, it probably requires like at least 40, if not more like 60 hours a week to do. And people can't just can't do that on top of their school or their work. So that's a hard thing to change. It would require a charter change, but it, it, it might be necessary to do in the long term to really see um, a city council and a government that, that really uh, reflect the community. Absolutely. I absolutely think this is a full-time job. I mean, I, I I think we all, would you all agree that counselors, counselors should be working <laughs> full-time? This should be a full-time job. Well, I like when they prepare. I yeah. like when they come into the meeting knowing the background and not all of them do. And that, that definitely takes time, especially when you have the mayor sending you huge packets of material without telling you what the point is or what you're looking for in there. Mm -hmm. So I would love to, I, you know, I would love to see all the counselors prepare um, as much as some of them do. Um, but at the same time, like, I know they're not, yeah, I don't know how much time that, that takes and I don't know how realistic that is for them. Yeah, not not without it actually being compensated as a full-time job. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's interesting too, because you, they, and I'm sure that there's arguments against it, which you're looking at, you don't want to have people that are just like a career bureaucrat or something. But at the same time, I think I'd almost rather have someone who's actually good at like running meetings and stuff in yeah. charge of these things. So I feel like that kind of stuff just doesn't hold water when I see people push back in that way. And because I mean, at the end of the day, like it is a skill into itself. And... Yeah. Mm -hmm. People come with their own experience. It's usually, I mean, it's, 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 you know, there are, you're seeing some more younger politicians, but I think there's always been some younger politicians. You often have people coming with their own various skills, backgrounds. Um, so, yeah, I've come to, the, to that same conclusion that it's not absolutely mandatory to have, you know, say that you do X, Y, Z at the same time. And especially just because it does seem to play out that it means that only a small subset of people can actually do this as a result because you have to be independently yeah. well yeah. to have like you know, a job that allows them or is a job that is actually invested in the outcomes of what the what the office does, which I mean, it, it, it's honestly difficult to see how like it isn't a conflict of interest to have business and tie-ins to real estate and be voting on any of this stuff. But Definitely. that's, yeah. Very convenient for our council that that's the case, and they have their own legal department to, to assist them in that. One of my highs um, was uh, you brought it up uh, a little bit ago, but um, the recording of the meetings. I, we, that was one of my highs the last time. Uh, but the high the last time was that money was allocated um, and that we were going to see it occur. Um, but the high this time is I didn't go to the city council once the entire session. I used to go every <laughs> single Monday for. Two and a half years of my life. I must um, miss you so much. Yeah, yeah. That, that, yeah. Has, that has changed our recording schedule. Yeah, as well yeah. Because we have to wait for them to upload some of them. Yeah, yeah. That, that we used to release on Tuesday. Now we release on uh, Friday or Thursday. Cheers um, to that. Yeah, cheers to that. Um, so yeah, I'm very happy about that. And I'm very happy that people that want to watch these uh, from home can now watch more of these meetings from home. And uh, definitely more of an audience uh, for that. And personally, uh, the other and I mean, like, honestly, it was the being able to watch it at home because of COVID, during COVID and then having that sort of like be made aware, made clear that that was going away. Yeah. You know, just, very motivating. Yeah. All right. I've held up. I rules and ordinances finally worked through the process and have approved permits for two retail cannabis dispensaries. Low. The mayor is squatting on the host community agreement. Is that is that true? Do we know that? I mean, that is a fair question. That, but that is a fair question. Um, thank you for asking that question because I got a little excited in the way I was expressing it. Mm -hmm. We we don't know whether she is actually sitting on it, so to speak. Um, the only thing we know is that she's not yet issued it. Um, you know, at at some point, the executor has to execute the host community agreement. So either she signs it or she doesn't. I don't know she's you know she's got a few other things going on, but um, the, basically, my understanding is that the hard part's been done. Um. 
and looking at other towns, I it just doesn't seem like there should be this much of a delay now, especially that we're through the holidays. Yeah. Uh, file under predictions. <laughs> uh, this, I mean, this has been an ongoing prediction that either this, I, I'll say for this year, either those community agreements um, are executed in pretty good due time for these two businesses um, or the CCC is going to start taking a real close look. Yeah, people, are, people are on track for having like dispensaries in like, literally every neighboring uh, city at this point. Oh, mm -hmm. It was driving to Watertown and so on for construction. So but you're right that that should be remembered as a high, even though we complained a lot about the fact that they redid hearings and they had things they had to wait on that were silly. We didn't like how long it took, but if you compare what happened this year to what didn't happen the past five years, yeah. um, they actually got it done. They, the city council got their part of it done. And it seemed like Councillor Harris and Councillor Darcy were the driving force they, behind it. They that. were. It like they like, to get it done. Yeah, I will. Um, kudos to Councillor Harris on that one. I will say um, she did the work on that mm -hmm. um, to get it through. Um, Darcy, you know, ran the process, and I, yeah, I agree. They were the two drivers on just finally getting that done. It took way too long. I don't want to give them too many kudos because of that, but uh, frankly, but it is something got done. that 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 really did get done. This, this yeah, don't in don't, a, in a don't step nobody yeah. has ever yeah. reached. We don't take too many kudos off, but <laughs> I'm glad you got it done. And it involved some, several extra meetings through the summer session too. Yes, um, yes. That was, that was, all the meetings for that. But uh, definitely uh, at least some uh, measurable progress in one area. <laughs> we made progress in one area. <laughs> uh, speaking of extra meetings, a high for me was definitely the master plan ward meetings, um, which saw meetings across all nine wards uh, to get input into a master plan. Um, uh, there's definitely like highs and lows associated with it. Uh, like highs was literally all the input um, given uh, was great. Um, we were there to record it all, mostly thanks to James. Thank you again. Um, and just hearing the constituent feedback, uh, you know, I was planning on, you know, enjoying like 30% of what people had to say, but really, I saw eye to eye with almost every single person that mm -hmm. spoke at all. It was proportional. Uh, yeah. And of course, of course, you know, uh, we organized our friends to go to these things, um, and a lot of them were familiar faces, but total strangers, uh, lots of total strangers saying the same things uh, that I would like to see happen in the city. And, I, you know, now we've become friends with a lot of them. And so it was a great opportunity uh, to for that for decision feedback, uh, which is rare. In a lot of them. Um, uh, some of the lows associated with it was the fact that I felt like the city wasn't taking it seriously at all. Uh, but we recorded nine out of nine, and the city recorded two out of nine, I believe. Uh, okay, yeah. yeah, and there was not enough uh, outreach done for these meetings. Uh, there was like some social media posts, and like some city councilors reached out to people on email, and then there were a few exceptions, like uh, Paul uh, Paul Cates, the Ward Seven City Councilor. He, um, he went door to door, uh, and that's great. That's exactly what people should be doing. Um, but for the most part, this was just kind of a thing that was put on the bulletin board outside of City Hall that we were going to do this. And then uh, whoever like managed to figure it out uh, got to go. Um, and so definitely, uh, I felt like the city wasn't taking it seriously enough, uh, not to mention the nonprofit meeting, which I felt like was a whole other can of worms. We talk about that more on our show, uh, a different episode that you should watch. But um but for but to invite the nonprofit leaders of our city into a meeting and then not even have the committee show up is just so insulting. Um but they, they they were back themselves into a corner there because if the committee yeah, had showed had up, it. it would have been those Yeah, yeah, which is a, is a mystery I might never know. It's like if if what would they what was, what was really happening there? I might not I might not ever figure that out. Um so that was definitely you know, a low else. yeah, <laughs> yeah, for real. Um so that was definitely a low in regards to that. But generally, I, I look back on those board meetings as a high uh, because you know I met a lot of cool people there, and uh, definitely interesting to see like when given the opportunity for Waltham to give input, it was 
mostly about pedestrianizing Waltham, uh, getting more cars off the road and protecting the public space. And, and pointing out that it's absolutely miserable to live through a highway that's plowed through your city, which is kind of what Main Street and Trapello are. Yeah. And there was, I don't know if we mentioned, so we had mentioned on the show, there was a person who wrote a social media post um, during the master plan process, kind of. Um, it was in Mrs. Venaria's Facebook group, which is kind of a, a community group, but sort of right leaning, they put um, that sort of saying there is a people with a certain agenda who've been showing up to these meetings. So we need the real Waltham people with the real agenda to show up too. And this person took issue with the fact um, that somebody had said we shouldn't be creating infrastructure and, you know, having more mechanics and things for gas cars because electric, we should be moving towards electric. And she thought uh, that was very radical. She said, I do not embrace, some of us do not embrace this futuristic Waltham. Interestingly, that same person since then got a bench named after them. Is that right? So hard for got a be the city council of environmentalism. The city council named a bench at Prospect Hill Park after that same person for her legacy of environmentalism. So, um, you know, when she had, I mentioned I think because she had that kind of implication in her post that there's this silent majority. Um, and that's a big thing with Mrs. Venaria. A lot of her posts are around this idea that, like, we, the real, real Waltham Knights, have to be aware of what these outsiders are trying to do. And so it brings up this big question of who are the real Walthamites? When um, Tom Stanley was running for state legislature as a Democrat, he was running against, um, Heather was challenging him in the Democratic primary, and Mrs. Venaria wrote an endorsement on for him. Um, so the most far right person in town endorsing somebody in the Democratic Party because he's the real Waltham, I guess. And she also she organized a standout before the last election with several of the city councilors, mostly the incumbents, but two of the challengers who it wasn't really clear what any of them had in common, except somebody decided they were the real Waltham people. So does this do these real Waltham people? exist. <laughs> I, think, I think one of the criteria that I've identified so far is to be a real wealth and you have to have family connections to businesses that operate in the city, which is pretty consistent across a lot of these people, it seems. That's a good point, yeah. And also the the oh, we, we talked about this with the with the tax meeting, but like uh, this comes back to sort of the way that the housing is built in the city and who lives in the city as a result. And a lot of these people are living in the single family zone areas, which are also disproportionately tax advantaged. And yet they pose them online and rhetorically as if they are the like main tax base of the city. Yeah, and it's yeah, it's a little disingenuous. I think actually, James, we should say you should get props. So your explanation of how the um, tax credit, the homeowner tax credit works, is not the most interesting or exciting thing we've talked about on the show, but it might be the most important because this fact that, that there's this constant rhetoric that it's single family. This is what Councilor McManaman actually said at that at that um, candidate event, the last one, the one that Mrs. Venario organized before the last election. She said, when you see all those beautiful businesses on Route 128 and our beautiful single family neighborhoods, that's who provides our tax revenue. If anything gets out of whack with that, then you know you don't have money for anything else. And it turns out that is not true, that renters pay, handle a bigger share of taxes than homeowners do. And that's by design. That's because we have a city council that sees themselves as representing homeowner interests and wanting to give them a break because that's their priority. And that should people that should be in the back of everyone's mind every time we hear a conversation where single family homeowners are being treated as if they're the ones sort of sponsoring the whole community, as if they're the ones that matter, where we now know they're being subsidized. They're, they're, they they're, show up at and in to get private ways repaved in areas too. I mean, it's not, it's not saying we shouldn't be fixing roads that are a problem, but like a lot of these roads, the, the sprawl into the suburbs was done with, you know, building private ways, building houses on them and building infrastructure under the roads and then with no real plan to maintain that too. It's just another way this thing gets subsidized. One more high and low we should touch on is the school um, budget. I think when we did our last wrap up, we were still like in the middle of this. 
but there was a low would definitely be that meeting where the um, city councilors grilled the superintendent. We now know that that for a fact that that was really demoralizing for some really good people in the system. Um, uh, but a high would be when the educators union basically won and got a contract with a higher raise and better um, parental leave language than what they were originally offered. And I wish we knew more of the story of how that happened. I'd love to look into, you know, how the money works when they end up spending more. I know that there's a contingency fund, um, but they had to go, the school committee had to go back to the city council and get the extra money approved after months and months of negotiation. So I wish we knew more of the inside story, but one thing that seems clear is that public pressure played a big role. The union got people to come into the school committee meeting. The union really mobilized their supporters, and that seems to have made the difference in a very long, um, difficult contract negotiation. So that's a high and a low, and something we'd love to cover more in the future. If anyone is interested in helping us cover the schools better, whether that means just going to the school committee meeting and sending us notes, or it could mean much more in depth than that. If you're interested, we'd love to cover the school system and particularly the high school better because it seems like a really important nexus for a lot of important things happening in town. So get in touch if you want to help us do that in the future. Well, one thing, are we doing predictions yet? I mean, we can we can pop one around. I've still had a couple of highs and lows, but go ahead. I've enjoyed the Moody Street Market like the, since they've been shutting that down. I'm a little concerned that they're going to not want to do that again. Are you predicting that they're not going to do it? I don't know if I want to predict that. I, like, I don't want to jinx it either way. And it seems it seems wildly it's, it seems wildly popular. I have a feeling that I'm going to predict that they're going to drag their feet and just refuse to do anything permanent. What's the precedent for other cities? Are they are they not? Are there some people not? Are some people not going back to that? I think it's kind of part of wanting to go back to normal. They view this yeah. as back to normal, yeah. just putting cars back on roads. Yeah. And like they can't seem to see the bigger picture of like what it means. To... I I can see what you're saying. I think it's going to depend on. The pressure because of what we heard, uh, the popularity of it at the master input meetings. There were a few, I come outliers because of how popular it was. Well, honestly, the only outlier, like the major outlier I saw was the landlord that showed yeah. up to say, I, my tenants, it would be awful if my tenants couldn't pay me to continue living, to continue yeah. living right. here. But it also, it's very compelling when somebody says, I, I bought a piece of land thinking I could use it for a certain thing. And then you came along and made it useless for that there's the fairness thing there and that's why so even if they're only a small number of landlords who are saying that it's very compelling but that shouldn't be a make or break because it, it's not just you know he was talking about how it doesn't the side streets get congested and, and problems with the way it is currently but if we had if we really decided we wanted to do this long term it could be part of a bigger plan um, to make it work better make the traffic around it flow better um, it doesn't have to always be exactly how it's been the past few years it's definitely like a, a habit the city has of sort of half doing something and then complaining that it isn't perfect and then using that as a reason not to fully do it. Um, one of my lows was uh, definitely the bike revolutions that happened. Um, I feel like I spent, I was looking back at all our debrief episodes, I feel like I spent like four out of 12 just like complaining a lot about um, the two bike resolutions that were in city council. And so in the past session, that definitely encapsulates a big low for me. Um, George Darcy putting in two resolutions about bike and pedestrian advocacy. Uh, the city council just immediately uh, took that and through political maneuvering, put it in political limbo, uh, which goes back to the master plan committee. Part of the lows about that um, was that this is a committee that's never met once <laughs> in, in a public floor. Uh, so. George puts in two resolutions looking to uh, create better bike and pedestrian advocacy. Uh, won't go too far into what it what it is, but uh, the council, in in a very council way, was like, "This is way too important issue to for us to be talking about it here. We need to put it to the master plan committee, where it'll be involved in the master plan, and then that will where where it will be taken seriously. So instead of talking about it on the city council floor and 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 doing anything with it, they put it, because they care so much, into a committee that never met, has never met, and probably may, might not ever will, because at the end of this, uh, right now, they're going to redo all the committee assignments, um, and so it'll be a brand new committee, uh, if it even continues to exist, 
uh, you know, it, it did it serve its purpose with master plan meetings. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's it for the master plan committee. Um, and so uh, George's two resolutions that I was very much looking forward to enjoying seeing move forward is now basically in political limbo. And I assume we will never uh, see the light of day. Worth mentioning because this is the same committee that has at least once strategically not met, which is the when it came to that nonprofit meeting that, that they didn't show up, so they didn't have a quorum, so it wasn't yeah. a violation. Same same committee that we're talking about. Yeah. Councillor LeBlanc mentioned at the last or one of the meetings at the end, he mentioned that they were going to bring in consultants um, to help them work on this, which I don't think was the plan from the beginning. I think that must have been added somewhere along once they realized so many people were attention and that's I'm wondering how that's going to work because the consultants are going to come and say what do you want us to analyze you didn't collect any data <laughs> you didn't even work so they're going to they might have to use our recording and honestly like I even point out that the, the method of outreach for all of the things means you won't be able to get like proper data because like if you have like counselors going door to door in one ward but then not others like right. it's skew the results yeah so I would predict once they hire the consultants we're going to get a survey because the consultants are going to say we need to start all over asking people what they think because you didn't record the answers in the right way, and then they'll they'll work from there. But I don't know. It's it just seems like behind the scenes someone started this process without totally getting <laughs> what the purpose was, and that they've sort of pivoted several times without trying trying not to make it obvious that they pivoted. Talking about open meeting law violations and this master plan committee, I don't understand how this committee makes decisions. Like even the consultants thing, like if it's not from the start, how is that decision made without doing it on the open public floor? Yeah. Because you're not allowed to make decisions outside of a committee and you're not also not allowed to make decision, talk to another counselor and make a decision and tell other people about that decision. That's illegal. That's a, just an open meeting law violation. And so I don't understand how this committee actually makes decisions. Like how right. do they, how, when and, where. Yeah, and I hear whispers like, oh, they're going to do a bike thing. Like how, where was that decision made? Yeah. Where, wh how are they how talking about that? Another yeah. Time. Move on to some predictions for the next cycle. If you recall, this will be um, the first half of an election year. Um, so, you know, there might be some more grandstanding uh, than usual. There's also the uh, city council president, um, the, all of the committee assignments, uh, they'll be different. Um, the city council president will be different. The committee chairs will be different. Um, and so Kathleen McMenamin, who is the dean of the city council, has been there uh, 40 years, uh, which is hard to think about sometimes. Um, uh, she, for the very first time, held the city council president role for the last uh, year. Um, and so there's a back and forth on if she's going to keep it or not. Uh, I'm going to predict that uh, she will not. And my second prediction is that uh, John McLaughlin will become city council president um, and very little will change. <laughs> but I think I, I foresee that happening. Why do you think that? Um, because at the last uh, city council meeting of the year, um, at the very end, Kathleen, uh, you know, thank everyone for, you know, allowing, not, not allowing her to be a city council president, but just like, being there for her during the city her city council presidency, I just felt like a goodbye. She's also getting older. I wouldn't be surprised if she didn't run at all uh, for the, this year. Um, although that wouldn't stop her city council president. Um, I just felt like I just felt like that's going to happen. I wouldn't be surprised if she was there. The council president again. I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if she came back because I get the sense um, a lot of the council sees her as the only person who knows what's going on all the time and that, that they might be nervous about. Although, um, who did you just say? Was John, McLaughlin. You? John McLaughlin. He's the vice president now. Mm -hmm. So he does committee of the whole and he does a good job with that, I think. So yeah. it's not impossible, but I'm just, I would just be surprised if they didn't put her back in president. And it's worth mentioning that in the past four years, a lot of the veterans of the city council are gone. Uh, Paul Brasco is gone. Robert Logan is gone. Diane LeBlanc is gone. Daniel Lombard is gone. Uh, Bill Fowler is gone. Um, yeah. Uh, actually, he actually was on. He was only on three. The kind of margins that are required to win these things, and I'm not surprised there's high turnover. So. Yeah. Speaking of margins, I think uh, Pauline Bradley MacArthur will win again. I think she will even move up from the last place to seventh, which is second to last place. And, uh, I think I think more than that. I don't want to get too specific, but I I think that 
I think that all of our canvassing and campaigning um, work is only strengthened. So and I also think Colleen's just done a good job. Yeah, I think she's totally just agree. made people happy with her decision making process. I think she's gone back to people. I think she's doing a good job listening and uh, when she needs to listen and talking when she feels like she has something to say. I think I think she's just doing a great job of the And I think most people would agree. Absolutely. I've been really happy seeing the way that. Uh, Councilor Claus and Councilor Bradley and MacArthur have been working together. And that's not at all a surprise. However, um, it's a tiny progressive little unit we've got on city council now, but at least we've got one now. And so that means it's nice to see that uh, at work over the past year. So we've seen, although, you know, a lot of pe people perceive as a very progressive and sort of outside the mainstream of the council, but he has had more established counselors. He's co-worked on things with more established counselors and, and, and co-introduced resolutions, I think. And we haven't really seen Colleen do that yet, if I'm not mistaken. Any predictions on wh when she will be able, when there will be more established counselors who reach out to her and say, hey, we want to work with you because they're obviously popular or? I think they're foolish if they don't. Uh um... I mean, why? Why would she is the least popular city councilor? <laughs> so, so there's really, I mean, it's, well, it, it's of, of the of the of, of the outlier city the outliers, outliers. Yeah. Well, I was gonna say I think that there could be some gender issues at play. Yeah. Um, power dynamics all around, all around yeah. the board. Yeah. But it seems like she she's got there's got to be an issue she has in common with some of the other councilors because she's not a radical. Like, yeah, yes. she's progressive like compared to the rest of the council but she she seems like she likes to work with people she seems like there's a lot of really non-controversial issues that she's also interested in so i think it's disappointing that yeah. nobody's reached out and said i want to do a joint something with her yeah so i think she's, she's made it sorry go ahead Nancy. i was gonna say she's also definitely making like putting the effort like they go to these meetings to report and more often than not she's also going to be there yes like, she's she's made it very uh you know clear that she would like to work cooperatively with her colleagues to get the work done. What I've seen is that it some of her colleagues are seem to be more interested in um, their own political agendas, uh, whether that is their careers or um, whatever it is, than getting the work done. In my in my in my perception. I mean, at what point, you know, we talked about how there's some people seem to perceive this side, there's a silent majority of the real Waltham people, and there's these these radical new people coming in. You know, if you if everyone's so convinced that that's inevitable, that more progressive people are gonna have more power, at what point do they say, I want to work with this nice progressive person? Because I, you know, and keep them in power so someone more radical doesn't commit. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, no offense, Chris, <laughs> but I think some of the counselors would rather work with Colleen than work with you. So why don't they work with her so that you don't get elected? <laughs> By the way, what's so bad about making progress? Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I think for them, it's because change like that represents a change to their potential economic conditions, right? Like they, they support the mayor and the council because they view them as making property values go up. And Ooh, like- it, There it, it is. It, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, my prediction, uh, this cycle, it might actually be next cycle, but I'll say this early, is that Paul Case will uh, flounder uh, as, a, as a city councilor. Uh, just because, just with this most recent uh, farm thing, Paul, is, Paul has always, since he got on uh, the council, positioned himself as a listening to his constituents kind of uh, city councilor. You know, I listen to my constituents and this is what they want. And uh, I talked about this months ago. And it's like, that's not really, like you can't, you can't hold yourself to that because it's not true. You're not going to do that all the time. And so you just can't, you can, that's not something you should say about yourself. You know, you should, there's, there's, few, there's a few more words in that sentence that you should, that you should say. And so, especially with the farm thing, which is where every single constituent was saying, go one way, go one way. And he said, well, I read 800 pages three times and I disagree with you all. Um, and so 
I think mm -hmm. he's especially gonna, when those 800 pages disagreed with what he concluded part of the introduction. Yeah, um, and so I think he's gonna have to do some identity searching, uh, figuring out like what kind of city councilor he is. Um, that being said, you know he did some things that I really enjoyed uh, this cycle, but I see him having a hard time, especially with an election year, especially with uh, if he acquires an opponent, um, figuring out like what kind of city council is he. Mm -hmm. I very much agree. I think we all had high hopes for that ward seat. Um, I think he does the work, and that's a, I appreciate that. I think he's less appreciated by constituents, but um, I think he, no, I think he does a good job of if 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 you have that you know view that a city councilor is like a customer service branch of the government he does that really well he reaches out to people who wouldn't be involved and otherwise he does the work he prepares for meetings i don't know if he was prepared for the situation where the mayor tells you you know asks you to approve something and leads you to believe that the long term goal situation exactly where it's like you can't it, you know where you have to there's no there's no moderate position you either stand up to the mayor you go along with the mayor and then you get blamed for what is unpopular. I don't think he was prepared for that. For the I nuance. The, the, the reaction didn't really seem to reflect like what the stakes were. Like they, they sort of focused down on like, no, this is just closing an entrance. How could this possibly affect anything else? Right. And then his sort of uh, like rationalization for voting that way is was, was like, like I said, was like, I read all these documents. I met with someone who's an expert in farming that isn't a constituent related in any way, and I came to this determination. But it, it is like, also at the same time, it looks like the mayor sort of was like, okay, this is what has to happen. And we want to get all of you people to vote for it, and they all voted for it. And it's like, all the things he said that were the reason why he voted for it seemed like they were kind of beside the point when it's just like, no, you voted for it because the mayor wanted you to. And the interesting thing about that vote, though, is it was kind of like an un before, never before seen coalition of people, right? Was there because you had, you know, Bazing and Bradley MacArthur who usually vote the same way, and then you had Darcy who often votes that way. You had Lacava who sometimes votes different from the group, and then you had and Gunn who almost never. That not, was a surprise. Not only did she vote. Uh, no, but she made one of the most uh, popular comments about it, but she got applause and stuff. So what does that mean? Yeah. Or could we see new ways of the city council splitting up does instead of the same old ways? Well, I, and honestly, like, I almost tie this back to like, the trust thing, how they were sort of saying you have to trust us and stuff. And I feel like with with, with, with uh, Karen Dunn, like a lot of the things that have been, that, that I've seen her sort of stand out on have been related to the school. And like that has been like an unpopular in her with her constituents because you're getting a lot of blasting, you're getting a lot of like disruption in the area. It's a pretty major operation to be happening, and it's also being done by a lot of the families that are related to like the the you know real wall fam. And but, she ran and won on an anti new high school yeah position. But but in, in this context, right? Like she's sort of already seen what it's like when like when the government is gonna sort of plow through regardless mm -hmm. with their plan. And you know, you can see the contours of that happening with the farm and with other nonprofits in the city now. And a lot of her uh literature said that she was a big proponent of open space. Um uh, so maybe that's actually true. You really don't see it that often in her votes. Uh coming to mind, one of the very first votes she made was uh protecting trying to protect Jericho Hill. Mm -hmm. Um which was really just like a way to like slow down the high school project. Uh, but she said like, oh, you know, I ran on preserving open space, so I care about this issue. It's like, oh, it just so happens that uh, you that you care about this issue, but won't sponsor pauses uh, tree resolution. And it just so happens that this is stopping uh, would would help slow down the uh, high school project. Um, but it's nice to see see her uh, on the right side of the world. I think that the giving giving sort of less unconditional trust to the to the mayor is a, is a reasonable determination to have made out of all of this, and if it means that there's a coalition to oppose it, I think it's a good thing. Cheers to that again. Oh, predictions! You mentioned Robert Logan. He has made some comments on our video, some nice comments, which I appreciate. But he's made a lot of comments on social media, which makes me think he's thinking of running again, maybe? Do uh, you think yeah. he's running? I mean, I wouldn't be surprised at all. I would say yes. I would say Robert Logan runs and Bill Hanley runs. 
Those are my two guesses. Well, what do you think Robert Logan runs for? At large. At large, okay. And what do you think Bill Hanley's going to run for? I don't even remember where he lives. He doesn't live in War Two anymore. Where does he live now? I don't know where he lives. I forget. The three, I think, was where I saw him at the meeting. At the yeah, he did, he did get him, but yeah, so he lives in three. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God, I wouldn't be surprised at all if he ran in War Three. Yeah, that'll be, uh, that'll be interesting. So we're going to have... So Logan... We're going to have mayor and all these seats up this year. And I mean, yeah, every single one. I don't think I don't think everyone's going to have a challenger. And I think that that's, not, that's probably why a lot of this farm stuff is happening during the winter, right? Like from the from that kind of angle, it just gets the stuff out of the way, and then like it's it's you know, the, gonna... lot of, like the, the critical decision has already been made, so there would be a big fight happening in the middle of the election period. Yeah. Although I think they kind of messed that up. I think yeah. that's fine. Actually, I think we haven't done back. predictions on the farm. What happens? Does the farm survive or is it all done? I'm I'm really not as conspiratorial as other people. I think I think I think the farm is gonna be totally fine. I go I always uh, said that my issue was how the mayor was going about this. I truly don't believe there's anything nefarious going on. I wouldn't be surprised if there was, um, considering the nature of people, uh, especially the mayor, but I don't think so. I just think the mayor just like went about this completely the wrong way, and I hate it. <laughs> so you think that they're gonna like the remediate the land? And they're, they're, but they're gonna remediate it in a way where the farm can stay open, or is the farm gonna have to shut down for some period of time? They'll have to move the greenhouses. They'll have to move the uh, the children's learning center um, activities. They'll have to move some things around. Yeah, I mean the vote's already been done. There, that's half, yeah. half of the I, farm is closed off. I ultimately I agree with with Chris, it's going to be a nightmare operationally, but, you know, look at Native Farm had their barn that was there for, I think, since the 70s, maybe burned down in the middle of the night, uh, and um, they still had a growing season, um, and not only did that barn house animals, but that was also one of their two greenhouses, um, you know, they had education programs associated with that. So, you know, they had to start rebuilding the barn. They had to fundraise. They had to do their education programs. They had to figure out how they were going to grow that season. And they did it. And they didn't shut down that season. Um, so it's not quite the same with challenges. But, you know, they also are one of those um, organizations that's a nonprofit that um, leases land from the municipality. And... In fact, their executive director is an employee of the city, so they're very connected. Um, but I think it's absolutely doable. I think it's um, where there's a will, there's a way, but I think it will be an operational nightmare. So they're gonna, so you think they'll submit an RFP for the other piece of land, the other half of the land, and that the city will accept it? I don't know what they will choose to do. I think they absolutely I think can. I mean, regardless, yeah, that's yeah. Like where you, this is going. you can operate on a farm on a very small piece of land. I think they will absolutely have to adjust their business plan. Um, you know, they may choose to do so. You know, reevaluate their plans when they put that there are no matter what. Um, as a matter of course. Um, and I also think that just because they've been on that land so long, they probably ha will end up having the strongest case as an applicant. Um, so I think, I think, yeah, so I think it's a matter of whether they choose to go forward, really, um, and then just, so just the getting that RFP in, they have a very strong case. But why would, if the mayor foresees that they're going to get their RFP accepted, why did, wouldn't, why didn't she work with them more on the transition? Why did she do it in this way that caused everyone to think she was trying to shut them down? That I don't have the answer to. I, I think my conjecture is that it's a personality thing. She's very hung up on well, I mean, she, of course, should be hung up on the legalities, but she's also hung up on the perception of the legalities. So there's the, you know, there's the legalities around these transactions, which, you know, I don't have a law background, um, so I can't speak to all those technicalities, but she's very, she seems very concerned about how everything looks. So I think she is trying to look 
like she doesn't have the address. That said, I, you know, as I mentioned on our, you know, last big discussion, I think it's reasonable and healthy to look at this with a very skeptical lens and think, you know, what could be the worst case scenario, but, you know, what could they possibly do other than look at what the options are in front of them, reach out for assistance from anyone else, um, and work on the RFP at the same time, you know, just look at all the options for one of them as a business and see if and how they can make it work for them this upcoming season and beyond. So nobody thinks that the mayor is setting the stage to get rid of them? There are plenty of people that uh, are thinking that. But uh, no one here. Yeah. Yeah. But so yeah. the, I mean, to be clear, the mayor cannot arbitrarily say you don't exist as a farm anymore. They are a nonprofit 501c3. They could. And it's going to sound cold and cal calculated. And I, I personally, I do not want this outcome. But to be clear, they could exist as a farm, as their business. And I know we've had a lot of discussion about what this means to be the farm that we mm -hmm. consider the farm, them farming on that land. But while Danfield's community farm um, in technical legal definitions could continue to exist, um, even if they weren't there, even if the mayor, even if they applied for the RFP and weren't granted it, they could farm somewhere else. They could call themselves Waltham Fields Community Farm and farm a piece of land somewhere else. Again, I am not at all advocating for this outcome, but the mayor cannot legally preclude Waltham Fields she, Community she Farm can, she from can existing. Company, but then right. at the same time, she can definitely and definitely seems to be making it difficult for them to operate. Absolutely. So it's like, Absolutely. at what point is this like, you know, not like, I mean, Stonewalling again, it's stonewalling, you know. Yeah, and it's, it speaks more of just like the need for like control and stuff like that. And that's what's so again, it's the, the them insisting that people trust them and that they have our best interests at heart when they've clearly made it clear by their own sort of administration that they have a very specific set of interests at heart. Interesting. It would be interesting if anyone knows and can help us figure out who has, who, who has a more law background. Um, this RFP process that they're doing, is that actually required or is that just? an interpretation is is she really is her hands tied in terms of the process she follows or not i have i find it hard to believe it is because somehow the lions club got on the fernal i think there are back doors yeah, to do things that people exactly. want to but i'd be interested to know what the legal issue is does anyone else have predictions about who's running too hot too hot i'll predict that half the counselors get opponents I think uh, that sounds about right. Which is definitely not as many des that deserve it, but I think that is where where we're at right now. How many? How many ran unopposed last time? It was most, last time it was most. most yeah. 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 So Renee Arena said she would run for school committee, but she said that back at the beginning of this year, and I haven't heard from her her speaking out in public much. So I don't know mm -hmm. if she's still planning on doing that. But there's three school committee seats up. We don't know for sure all three will run for re-election. So if someone doesn't run and Arena runs, then she gets a seat. So somebody run for school, <laughs> school committee, please. Um, we can put you in touch with people who can tell you all about what's required to be on the school committee and run for it. Um, so yes, we definitely uh, need uh, school committee candidates just in case um, we end up with very limited options. Should we plug the upcoming? Yes, events? good idea. Um, we are having, as you know, an event on January 18th. It will be a live event on Zoom with Councilor Bradley MacArthur. Yes, we're going to have a panel of experts, including her, people who run for office, people who have volunteered on campaigns um, to give everyone the basics of how to do this. If you ever thought about running for office, if you have someone in your life who you want to encourage to run for office by telling them useful information that you could use to help them, um, then you definitely should come to this event. We'll make sure you get the basics of what's involved. And um, from somebody who had a pretty impressive victory last time around. Also, if you consider yourself a progressive and you're considering running for office, you should consider taking the Mass Alliance training, which is having signups right now. They teach a very specific grassroots strategy that has worked for people in Waltham. 
Um, so even if you know nothing about running for office, you have resources that could get you up to speed very quickly. So now's the time of the year to be thinking about that. And also even uh, for folks that aren't thinking about running for office or want to encourage anyone to run for office, also just affecting change in Waltham too. We're going to be going over that, uh, a lot about that. Volunteering for campaigns as well. Um, we're having people that have volunteered for many campaigns talking about the experience. Um, it's good to have a great candidate, um, but you also need a great campaign manager, you need great volunteers, you need a lot of them. And so that that makes or breaks campaigns. Just how many, can you knock on more doors than your opponent? Can you raise more money than your opponent? And so just, uh, we'll be going over all of that. So it's, it's better, even if running for office is not really in your purview at the moment, but just getting more involved in your community, I think is going to be very important this election year. So we invite you to come to that and to do that. And unless anybody else has anything else to say, I think that'll wrap it up. It's that's been a whole city council session. That's it. And <laughs> the next one starts literally next week. We had a little bit more of a of a summer break <laughs> the last session, um, but we're we're going to continue doing this. We're going to continue being on every week, talking about city council and Waltham, and encouraging folks to pay more attention, to get more involved, and I'm looking forward to it. Looking forward to working with everyone. Thanks yeah. for watching, Thank everyone. You. It was fun. Bye, everyone. Yeah.